alcohol. It's responsible for a multi-billion dollar industry. The most fun parties. The least fun mornings after those parties. And maybe even the accidental existence of a lot of you watching. It has certainly helped me write a lot of these scripts. In fact, I wrote this script under the influence of alcohol. Putting that aside, this video will cover the geography of alcohol consumption around the world, given the current state of the 21st century. Now obviously, the history of alcohol has morphed and changed since its early days all the way back to the Neolithic era, back before true civilization even existed. It's not a surprise that the first true alcoholic drinks that were produced by humans happened around the Neolithic era when humans started farming, since, at the end of the day, almost all alcohol comes from the plants we farm. Although I guess you could include monkeys getting drunk off of fermented fruit, and in that case, alcohol is even older than humans itself. Nonetheless, this video will not delve into the incredibly rich and fascinating history of alcohol that deserves its own video, but rather the geography of alcohol around the current world. Let's start with Europe. Given the fact that Europe has dominated much of the modern world for better or for worse, and has led to the globalization of that world, it's not a surprise that European taste and alcohol consumption have rapidly spread to other regions of the world. However, European preferences for alcohol vary vastly depending on what country or even portion of a country you are looking at. Generally speaking, a country's cuisine and beverage consumption will be, for the most part, linked with its climate. After all, certain types of food grow in certain countries better than others. Now, given that we live in a globalized economy, you can import food from the rest of the world, which is why coffee is very popular in cold countries like Canada, despite usually growing in rainforests. But it's imported to colder countries, so that no longer is the case. However, nonetheless, a climate of a country and its overall physical geography does still have a significant impact on the food and beverages that those people consume since they can grow the ingredients for those foods and beverages more easily. This is why, generally speaking on the European continent, you tend to see more wine being grown in Southern Europe and a lot more beer being grown in Northern Europe. This is not to say that they are mutually exclusive though. The Spaniards, while being excellent wine producers, also produced their wide variety of beers. People in the UK, known for their love of beer, still enjoy drinking wine nonetheless. And on top of that, there are regional preferences within these countries that complicate these matters. Grapes, for example, do the best in Mediterranean climates. These are climates around, well, the Mediterranean, of course, and they tend to be rather warm and conducive for human habitation, and relatively dry, but not dry enough to be a desert. And for this reason, much of Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and parts of France tend to be excellent for producing grapes and thereby wine. On the other hand, many countries with colder weather climates will tend to prefer beer. The reason for this is that the grains used to produce beer, like wheat, barley, and rye, tend to do a lot better in harsher, wetter climates such as those on the British Isles, Germany, and Scandinavia. As a result of this, you have Germany, quite possibly the most iconic beer producer in the world, as well as the Netherlands, famous for Heineken, the most popular beer in the world, period. In areas where you have the most Celtic influence, like Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, you also tend to have the darkest beers, also known as stouts. Generally speaking, these have a higher color content, tend to be more bitter, and tend to be far darker in color than the sort of beers you see in other parts of the continent. Beers coming from Southern Europe, generally speaking, are more likely to be lagers with a lighter color. However, keep in mind that there are plenty of exceptions. In the UK, in particular, you saw the rise of Indian Pale Ale, also known as IPAs. These have a lot of hops in them. Hops are one of the four critical ingredients for beer, along with a type of grain, water, and yeast. 
because the British Empire spanned a gigantic swath of the world, and because they required alcohol that had a long shelf life, these IPAs ended up spreading around the world, most notably to places such as India, where, you know, the name comes from, or New England in what is now the United States, in places like Massachusetts, where you see pale ale consumption being rather high. These regions are rather accustomed to liking the rather bitter and floral tastes. However, many others find it off-putting. In Germany, the region most famed for its beer production probably would be Bavaria. This is part of southwest Germany, also known for really being the most German part of Germany with its iconic architecture and Oktoberfest, which is basically centered around stuffing your face with tons of beer, pretzels, and sausages. And by sausages, I'm talking about actual sausages, not any subtle sexual reference, although I assume with that amount of beer consumption, there probably is that too. Today, Germany, along with the Netherlands and the United States, are the biggest exporters of beer around the world. Moving a little bit further west, you have Belgium. In Belgium, you have it your own universe of craftsmanship around beer. In fact, this unappreciated country actually has its own UNESCO designation given the beer craftsmanship that exists in this country. Most Americans would probably be familiar with Belgian Moon or Blue Moon, which while not being Belgian itself is totally inspired by Belgium. France, on the other hand, has plenty of beer, but they tend to take more pride in their wine. In fact, most regions of France have their own distinct version of wine, and depending on the type of grapes, you get different types of wine, and those grapes, by and large, are dependent on the climate and soil. For example, if you've had champagne, chances are it wasn't actual champagne. Real champagne isn't merely any sort of sparkling wine, but a sparkling wine that specifically comes from a French region literally called Champagne. So, if you bought quote-unquote champagne that was not from quote-unquote champagne, then you've been bullshitting. Sorry to tell you that, you were just drinking crappy sparkling wine. As you move further east, you get to countries that are predominantly Slavic, where you see far more interest in spirits. These tend to have a higher alcohol content. And the Slavs, by and large, let's just say, love to be cultural alcoholics, if you will. I know it's a stereotype, but... Generally speaking, stereotypes do have an element of truth. These countries have some of the highest rates of alcohol consumption, and more unfortunately, alcoholism. This doesn't necessarily surprise me, since after all, many of these spirits have an alcohol percentage that is much higher than, say, beer or wine. It's much easier to get drunk off of a little bit of vodka than a little bit of beer. This is because vodka oftentimes alcohol percent percentages that are like 35, 40, 50, 60, as opposed to beer that fluctuate between 4 and 8 percent. In fact, the situation got so bad with alcoholism that during the 1980s, the premier of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev, declared alcoholism to be a national epidemic. Part of the reason for the popularity of spirits, and most notably vodka, is that the climate here is rather tough and not conducive for growing a lot of crops. However, one really hardy crop is the potato. Potatoes can be used for making vodka. Generally speaking, countries that were once communist tend to have very high rates of alcohol consumption, and in particular spirit consumption, and even more in particular vodka consumption. However, there are some exceptions. For example, the Czech Republic is renowned for its great breweries. If you go further south into the Middle East and North Africa, you'll see far less alcohol consumption. The primary reason being is that Islam forbids alcohol. However, this is not to say that it's illegal everywhere, as many of these countries do have some alcohol consumption due to the fact that, one, they get a lot of tourists, in some cases like Morocco, and on top of that, they also have a lot of religious minorities. With that being said, there are large swaths of the Muslim population that do drink alcohol on occasion. In fact, the birthplace of some of the oldest types of alcohol like beer were in the Middle East, first produced in ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. This doesn't surprise me, as after all, these places produced many grains that were then used to produce beer. On top of that, today, 
Many of these countries, particularly in the Levant, have higher Christian populations like Lebanon and Syria, who are quite conducive to drinking beer, and many of the Muslim populations that are less devout tend to also enjoy some beer on relative occasion as well. Another country that is known for having relatively easy access to alcohol is the UAE, as the majority of its population is composed of expats, as you will see liquor stores and bars all over Dubai and Abu Dhabi. However, many of the men from these countries, like the UAE, are prohibited from wearing their national dress at bars, and usually have to dress up in Western clothing if they want to drink. On the other hand, there are a number of countries that blatantly prohibit alcohol consumption, such as Saudi Arabia. Nonetheless, Saudi Arabia has a large expat community, and many of these expats produce moonshine in their own garages and bathtubs. On top of that, many Saudis like to drive to other countries nearby that do not prohibit alcohol and drink there. This is the reason why that many of these roads tend to be rather dangerous. In fact, even within these countries, you see different jurisdictions. In the Emirate of Sharjah and the UAE, they prohibit alcohol, whereas in Dubai, they allow alcohol. And as a result of that, you see many people from Sharjah driving to Dubai, drinking, and then driving back, leading to a disproportionate number of automobile collisions. Alcohol is also widely consumed in Israel, as a majority of the population is Jewish, a religion that does not prohibit alcohol. And on top of that, while many of these Jews come from Middle Eastern countries, many of them also come from Central and Eastern Europe with their large histories of beer craftsmanship. This has resulted in Israel having its own kind of microbrewery culture. If you move further south, you get to Sub-Saharan Africa. This was quite possibly the most challenging part of the world to research when it came to the history of modern alcohol consumption. The reason being is that Africa's history tends to be based off of an oral tradition rather than written ones, making sources less reliable. On top of that, because Africa is relatively underdeveloped compared to most other parts of the world, there aren't as many sources in order to better understand alcohol consumption. Nonetheless, there are some factors that are unsurprising. For example, most of the Muslim countries or Muslim-majority populations tend to drink less alcohol. This can be found in the Sahel region as well as parts of East Africa. However, as you move further south into areas that are made up of predominantly Christians and people practicing African pagan religions, there is more alcohol consumption. Now, just because we don't know that much about it, this is not to say that Africans haven't produced their own fascinating forms of alcohol. For example, millet, a grain that originally traced back to China, was eventually brought to Africa and has been used to produce certain types of malted beer, as well as other forms of alcohol. When I went to Tanzania, I had the pleasure of trying banana beer, which they actually ferment a certain type of banana to produce a type of beer that is currently fresh and very frothy with a very low alcohol percentage. However, by the time it's bottled and ready for exporting, it moves from being around 3% to being around 13%. South Africa, with its mostly Western influence, obviously has its own interesting beer and cider culture, primarily as a result of the Dutch, German, and British people who settled down in the country. If you move to the Indian subcontinent, you will see a very complex relationship with alcohol. In some Muslim-majority portions of the country, you actually see alcohol being prohibited. Nonetheless, the country is still majority Hindu, and most of the country still has areas that allow for alcohol consumption. This may not be as widespread as it is in Europe, but nonetheless, there are still a wide variety of different types of alcohol that are actually native to the Indian subcontinent, oftentimes made by unique types of ingredients such as jackfruit or pineapple which makes these sort of alcoholic beverages more sweet or acidic or floral. On top of that, given the influence of the British Empire and the influence of the French and Portuguese empires in smaller portions of what is now India, you do see specialized types of Indian beer, rum, vodka, whiskey, and wine. If you move further east, you arrive at East Asia, where alcoholic beverages are by and large far more popular than they are in the Indian subcontinent or the Middle East. However, given the fact that the staple crop in this region is rice, you see a disproportionate number of alcoholic beverages being produced from rice. Baiju, which I am almost certainly mispronouncing terribly, 
is not only a popular form of alcohol in China, but in many ways is the most popular form of alcohol, given the fact that China has such a massive population, and on top of that, its diaspora is pretty massive as well. And this isn't kids stuff. Some of this Chinese alcohol can range from 60 to 66%, which is terrible for your liver, but is really good for having a lot of fun, at least in the short run. Much of this comes from a grain called sorghum. Sorghum is a cereal crop like wheat and rice, but on top of that, it actually isn't oftentimes associated with China, but rather West Africa. Nonetheless, it is found in China. And it is oftentimes mixed with other grains that produce alcohol like rice, barley, and millet. Even that China has such a gigantic cultural presence in East Asia, its influence is also spread to nearby nations, such as the Koreas and Japan, where you see variations of the same sort of alcoholic beverages being primarily produced by rice or sorghum. In the West, you have a stereotype about East Asians being very judicious, calm, rational, and calculated. However, it is worth noting that many parts of the world like this actually have very high rates of alcohol consumption, in many cases on par with what you would see in Eastern Europe, with beverages that make your typical beer in North America look like a kid's apple juice box. The complexity of alcohol in China deserves an entire video on its own, and I am not even scratching the surface. Nonetheless, Chinese alcohol consumption, particularly that of high-end alcohol, has increased drastically as a result of the country becoming far more wealthy. I'd be interested to see in how this trend changes over time and how it's affected the diaspora population. Nonetheless, if you move further east of the Korean Peninsula, you have your own variety of unique forms of alcohol production. A lot of people are shocked to find out that South Korea has one of the highest rates of alcohol consumption in the world. Many of us tend to stereotype South Koreans as, very, as being very studious and hardworking, and while that stereotype does have a lot of truth behind it, it's also worth noting that they also have a very intensive drinking culture that is tied with their working culture. They work hard and they party hard. It's oftentimes part of the culture of South Korea and Japan to have employees drink with their managers. It's a form of social bonding whereby they really bust their asses late at night at work, and then they drink the liquor stores and bars dry afterwards. Many foreigners who do business in South Korea are shocked to find out how much of a toll it takes on their kidneys when they're working with Koreans. At the end of the day, this doesn't surprise me too much. After all, Korean cuisine is quite fond of fermented food. Kimchi is made up of fermented cabbage, and gang is made up of a fermented chili paste, so it makes sense that they would like their beverages to be fermented too. Japan is also renowned for its variety of alcoholic beverages, again primarily coming from rice. Most famous of all is sake, at least abroad. This is a type of rice wine. Most non-Japanese people will be familiar with Sapporo, which is a brewery coming from the northern island of Japan, and oftentimes these advertisements will focus on the way that the West has influenced Japan and how Japanese people have repackaged that cultural tradition and sold it to Westerners. If you go down south, you get to Southeast Asia. Here you see a variety of different drinking cultures, with many countries like Indonesia and Malaysia having less alcohol consumption as they're predominantly Muslim, as opposed to their Buddhist and Christian majority country counterparts. Nonetheless, even in Indonesia and Malaysia, you see by and large, more lax tendencies towards alcohol than you do in the Middle East and other Muslim-majority parts of the world. Likewise, countries like the Philippines have the Spanish and American influence, so they love their alcohol. And many of these countries, again, have their own unique varieties. If you go down further south, you'll reach Australia and New Zealand. Here, you tend to see alcohol consumption patterns that are quite similar to what you would see in Northwestern Europe. And it's not a surprise that most Australians and New Zealanders trace their heritage to that part of the world. However, one thing that a lot of people are surprised about is that a lot of the beer that Australia exports isn't actually that popular in Australia. Foster's, for example, is very well known abroad. However, most Australians don't drink it. It's an export beer. Most Australians tend to drink beer from their specific state. 
for example, when I was living in Western Australia, I would see people drink types of beer like Little Creatures, Black Swan, and Emu Export. None of them touched Fosters, and most of them described it to tasting like piss. Anyway, moving on to the Americas. Before Christopher Columbus, the Americas did have their unique styles of alcohol. However, they were quite smaller in scope. You have to keep in mind that with the exception of Mesoamerica and the Andes, you didn't see the widespread use of civilization and mass agriculture as you did in the Old World. As a result, there was less access to crops that could produce alcohol. This is not to say that the Native Americans didn't like getting high or didn't like mind-altering substances. After all, peyote is from the Americas. But nonetheless, you did see a more limited variety. However, there are still some traditions that are continuing to this day. If you've ever been to Peru, you could probably get your hands on some corn beer. Corn is the primary staple crop in the Americas, and it's not a surprise that the indigenous peoples of this region would ferment it and use the ethanol to produce their own types of alcohol. If you ever go to the Andes region in South America, such as Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, etc., I'd highly recommend getting a pint of corn beer. In the southern cone, in countries like Argentina and Chile, you had more of a Mediterranean climate, and you also had a population primarily composed of Southern Europeans like Spaniards and Italians. As a result of this, both in terms of people and climate, you see a great deal of wine production. In fact, if you buy affordable wine, it will probably either come from Australia or Chile or Argentina. That way you can get drunk and be fancy, while not burning a hole through your wallet like you would with French or Italian wine. Beer is also super popular. After all, Corona, one of the most popular types of beer in the world and the most popular type of beer in California, happens to be from Mexico. Speaking of California, the United States also has a rich tradition of alcohol production and consumption. Given that most Americans trace their lineage to Europe, most of these tastes in alcohol have been imported from Europe namely countries like Germany and the British Isles. British Isles, that's not a country. I meant the UK and Ireland. As a result of this, you saw the proliferation of breweries, primarily founded by Germans, most notably Budweiser. And while not tasting that great, Budweiser has become one of the most iconic forms of beer on the planet. In places where you had a warmer, drier climate like California, you saw the rise of grape production, which is why California produces a gigantic amount of grapes. Spirits have also been quite popular, most notably whiskey. In the UK, the sort of father country of the United States, you had scotch, which was a Scottish whiskey. While many of those people settled in the Appalachias in the, what is now the United States and produced bourbon. Bourbon is a type of whiskey that is produced using corn. If you are drinking something called bourbon and it's not from Kentucky, then lo and behold, you're not drinking real bourbon. And there you have it. A disgustingly oversimplified story about alcohol around the world. Thanks for watching.